of our Vice President. We pray, Father God, for the whole governing body, both Republican and Democrat, that they, Lord God, repent and receive you as Lord and Savior, especially our President and his family, and our Vice President and his family, and all those who are in government, all those who declare that they know you, Lord, let them repent and get to know you. Let them know you according to the word of God, not according to their concepts, not according to their religiosity, not according to their denominational teaching, but according to the word of God. That, Father God, their hearts are circumcised. That, Lord God, that they're circumcised so that, Lord, the, the, the skin, the hardness of their skin is pulled back. And, Lord God, you can put your finger right where it belongs, on the heart of man. I pray, Father God, as we're called to pray for all our leaders, starting with our presidents, all the way down, Father God, to our state leaders, Father God, Lord God, to our village leaders, to those who have been placed in authority as leaders in the church. I pray for every last one of them, Lord God, to bow their knee right now to you, to you alone. Not to the public, not to the world, not to the humanism, not to what they think is right, but to your word. And that, Father God, they receive you as Lord and Savior. I pray that every pastor, everyone that stands behind that pulpit, everyone that's part of the five-fold ministry, that, Lord God, they embrace the word of God. They embrace the cross. Lord God, that they embrace you and you alone. Your word has declared, Father God. That man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of the Father. And all the people of God do say, Amen. Yes, amen. Hallelujah.
greatest. If the enemy comes against you, you tell him that God is greater. And that greatness of God, he that dwelleth in you, is greater than the world. And that's God's word to you and I as his people. Amen.
lifted up above mine enemies. Round about me, therefore, will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. Sacrifices of joy. praises unto the Lord. Hear me, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. Have mercy also upon me, and answer me. When thou saidest, Seek ye my face, my heart said unto thee, Thy face, Lord, will I seek. And everyone said, talking about seeking God's will. Not just the hands of his blessing, but God's will. I believe more than any other time in our culture, we need to seek God's will. There are lines being drawn and have been drawn. There are convictions that will be tested. But I want you to know those lines that are drawn are not drawn by man even though they think they are. They're drawn by God. His word is not up for discussion. His word is his word. And what is right is right, and what is wrong is wrong. I don't care how many people say the opposite. I don't care how many people want to define or redefine God's word. God's word is the absolute. And if anyone is a true, genuine believer, the word of God that they declare they abide in is the same word that should be abiding in their hearts. It draws a line between emotions, draws a line between traditions, it draws a line between family. The word of God, Jesus Christ says, I've not come to bring peace, but I have come to bring division. And what he's talking about is not division like we see right now, but maybe it is. The division that he's talking about is the word of God as compared to the word of man. Amen. The wisdom of God is compared to the wisdom of man. This day and time, this nation, this world stands on a pivotal crossroads, I'm telling you. Like you've never known before, like you've never seen before. It's not just about the elections in November. It's not just about what's going on in, in this part of the country and what, what's going on climatically in the Gulf or what's going on in, in California or what's going on here with the earthquake. It's not about just those things. But yet, it is. We are at a crossroads like I've never known before in my life. And at my age, I can say that with confidence, that I've seen a lot of things. My dad, at his age, at 90 years old, has seen a lot of things. And I want you to know that every decision, decision that you make needs to be based on your convictions, what you truly believe in. If you're a believer, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, there's a certain mandate that you and I ought to, to stay firm on. God's Word. Regardless of how you feel emotionally, regardless of how you feel personally, you are blood-bought, redeemed child of God. That means there's a certain criteria that you and I are to walk by. That's in everyday life. Every decision we make, and yes, we are a work in progress, but brothers and sisters, if we're not progressively going forward in Jesus Christ, then you're going nowhere. This world is at odds against what is right. I'm telling you that point blank. No matter how you cut it up, this world and the philosophies of this world is at odds, is at war against what is right. And what is right is God's word. In every level of life where God's word is clear, that's what's right. And anything other than that, no matter how it appeals to our emotions, or how it drags or wants to weigh down our hearts, it does not, does not remove the absoluteness of God's word, which is true. I say that because of everything that we're going through, everything that we will go through, 
everything that is coming up. And believe me, everything that is coming up is a foreshadow of what you can expect will come. We have hope because our hope is not built in ourselves. We have hope because our hope is not built in a building or religiosity. Our hope is built on relationship. That means he's ahead and we're the tail. That means that he's above and we're not. That means that he is the great I am. We're not. Way back when, in the, when God dispersed the people, he told him, he said, whatever you do, don't congregate together and form one language. Or, because he said, that's going to be a problem. It's called the Tower of Babel. It was a physical Tower of Babel that God came back and dispersed them because they didn't obey him. That was the beginning of many religions, many different languages, religions, and all. I want you to know that even though God dispersed it and tore down, broke down the physical Tower of Babel, spiritually that's been being rebuilt all this while. God will not disperse the spiritual Babylon, Tower of Babel. He will destroy it because the Tower of Babel or the Tower of Babel, the Babylon society, if you will, the worldliness, the, the New Age movement, all these things that are combined in there under the yoke of humanicism, that is the God of this world. That's not the God of creation. Before I ask my customary question, I want Sister Adrian to sing that song again, and I want you to listen to it. The majesty. We've got time. Because you see, this is what this is all about. God is the great I am. He is the majesty. There's no one else that you should bow or ever consider bowing to other than the Lord Jesus Christ. You lift your hands into the Lord and let him feel you. Your hands in your hearts and worship and praise. Holy Spirit, take control this morning. This is good words to make your heart soar.
or three comments that I want you to post somewhere around your title. And when you listen to this message or when you study it at home and read the scriptures, I'm asking the Holy Spirit to do with you that he did with me. To paint such a, a vivid word picture of the scene that we're in today, the life that we're in today, the culture that we're in today, and what we are truly up against. I'm asking the Lord, the Holy Spirit, to enable you to see clearly how you need to be found, whether you go to meet him tomorrow or whether he comes to get you tomorrow. You need to be found in between now and that moment on the right side. And I want you to know there's only one right side. Not yours, not mine. But God's. Amen. Again, I want to welcome everyone here. I ask that the Lord God bless you and keep you in all your ways. I ask that he guide you and direct your steps. The Lord of God is the lamp of our feet and the light of our path when we follow it. And for all those who will be watching this video message a little bit later on during the week or whenever, I ask that the Lord God open your eyes to the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. That you draw nigh unto God and He will draw nigh unto you in a real way. Not in a religious way, not in a traditional way, but in the right way. In humility, gratitude, and thankfulness. I also pray that everyone that is here, especially this part of the country, that we Continue to stay in prayer for mercy concerning our shorelines, our Gulf Coast, and the different storms that are may or may not be approaching. These are types and shadows of things that are really going on as far as I'm concerned spiritually. And the whole point of it is, is that you never drop your guard. You stay prepared at all times, whether it be the physical storms that you face, we face, or the spiritual, which to me are one and the same. Today's message, as I shared with you earlier, is who do you serve? And the points or the uh, words that I would like you, or comments that I'd like you to put in parentheses next to that title is this. In, but not of. In, but not of. And blurred lines are deceptive. And last but not least, I want you to put world, and I'd like you to put an equal sign, and put cosmos. Now the Greek word for, in particular translation, is cosmos, which is speaking about the world, which the Lord Jesus Christ is speaking about. It's spelled K-O-S-M-O-S, we spell it C-O-S-M-O-S. But I want you to put that there on the side, too. Because, see, what I'm going to be talking about is separation, not isolation. What I'm going to be talking about is the lines that are drawn, not religion, but relationship. And what I'm going to be talking about is being in the world, physical world, but not of the cosmos, the mentality of the world, and that's what it's speaking about. Did you hear what I said? And that's why these words are very important to place on the side of your title. And this is how the Lord opened it up for me to share with you today. A lot of people say, well, Pastor, I just want a quick message in the wrong place. It'll be over when it's over, but I promise you, you'll still have time to eat lunch, okay? <clears throat> but what's most importantly is that we eat the meat of God's Word. So that we hear what we need to hear. And we're able not only to hear what we need to hear, but do what needs to be done. Amen. Amen. And that's what I'm at today. And that's why, to me, we are at a crossroads in this nation, in this world, and in the church. And it's going to be determined. What's going to determine it for the church is the same thing that's going to determine it for the world. Is God's word and where that line is drawn. You know, a lot of people say, well, we're in church, so therefore we're, we're believers. We're in church, but 
you always have a people within a people. As God's word says, a remnant within a remnant. Even in, in the waters, you have an ocean, but you have different waters within a water. It's amazing how that works. And it's the same thing here. You have people within a nation. You have people within a church that, that are all <clears throat> supposed to be of one mind, one heart, one accord, but they're not. And that's the biggest grievance that I have in my heart. It's not because of the nation. I expect that. That's the world. That's the cosmos. That's the mentality of the God of this world, which promotes humanism, which promotes emotionalism. All these things, the I is, and that's the very thing that he promoted at the beginning of time in Genesis. When he brought the doubt into the conversation with Eve, it became about the I is, uh, dealing with the eye, the eye is compared to that of the, the godliness or God's word. Godness, godliness compared to the eye is. And from that point on, you know what happened. The Bible says that man fell. What we are experiencing now is that curse from the fall of man. <clears throat> the world, the physical world, and the cosmos. If you will, the second heaven is the spiritual mentality of this world, which is still from the fall of nature. Now, I know this is a lot of rhetoric, but it's something that needs to be said up front. The first reading I want you to open to is 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 21. And again, remember the title of the message is, Who Do You Serve? And that's not a hard question. I mean, that's not a, what I would call an original question, because Elijah asked the same thing of God's people. Didn't he? He came to Ahab, to, who was the, the northern king for, for Israel. And what did he, he wasn't the king of Judah, but he was the king of Israel. So what did he ask him? That's right. He has the people of God, and that's where the crossroads is for the church, actually. And I'm not afraid to bring it to the church. Starting with my heart. The Bible says that Elijah, and Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt you between two opinions? If the Lord be God, what? Follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the problem was, the people of God didn't know. They answered him not. Isn't that something? They answered him not. You'll find the same statement that Jesus Christ made in Matthew 6, 24. In 1 John 2, 15. In Matthew 6, 24, he declared, he said, man, he said, you can't serve two masters. You serve Man or God, you can't love, you know, you're going to love one and hate the other, or hate one and love the other, but you can't serve the both. And in 1 John 2, 15, he says, love not the world and the things of the world. Because if you do, that's not of God. Now, the problem that most of us have is being in the world, but not of the world. The problem that most of us have is when the lines are no longer clear what that means. Our decisions are smudged by the lines that we smudge through compromise or whatever it may be, whatever reason that we have. So when it, as the more that we smudge the lines, the less clear it is what God's word really means in every situation that we confront. A lot of people say, well, he didn't mean that. He didn't mean that. But God's word is clear what it meant. It's written so we can understand. You don't have to be a theologian. No, I have a doctor's degree to understand that. That's why God's word was made uh, accessible to all men. You can read it and understand. I know a lot of people get hung up on the thousand these, but the thousand these are not the context of the word. The word is the word. You remove those and you still have the, the heart of the word. And today, in today's time, that's what needs to be asked to the church. You can't ask it to the world because that their answer is a precept and a concept of godliness according to them. The godliness that I'm speaking of is according to the word of God. 
It's called biblical Christianity as compared to worldly Christianity. There's no such thing as worldly Christianity. It's a deception. It's a delusion. The lines of God are drawn clearly. You're either for him or you're against him. And, and he's going to, that, that question is definitive as it is, as it is, will be answered more than with our words. It will be answered by the choices that we make, even more so now, because it's clearer and becoming clearer and clearer, because God's word is definitely drawing more and more definitive lines. You are, you aren't. As we shared earlier, how many people do we know that everybody wants to say that they're believers, Christians, but what comes out of their mouths and out of their hearts is an oxymoron, if not an out and out contradiction. And I, I find that in the, the political arena, you know, everybody wants to claim, you know, that Jesus, if you're a true believer, you wouldn't do this, you wouldn't do that, or you wouldn't vote for this, or vote for that, or vote for him, or all this stuff, and this is not, not about, you know what I'm talking about. It's not about politics, but this is about what's going on. In our culture. Because it's not about what you see. It's what's going on behind the line, so to speak. There's a manipulation, a manipulative power just coercing people into a, a, like a, like people being driven by a cattle prod, being brought, and they don't know where they're going because they're blind. They think they're coming to a, 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 an expected end for the good of whatever they, they're marching to. But it's exactly what was allowed for them to think upon because it's what was fed to them. And the feeding of what you feed off the most is how you will re react or respond. If the word of God can be, can be more or less smudged away, just a little glimpse of it, then it's easy for confusion to come in. That's why the Lord God says he's not the author of confusion. It's clear what he says and what is right and what is not. The Bible says in Matthew 6, 24, and I just paraphrased it, but at this point, let's start off with reading it as it is. And then as the, as the message goes on, as the Lord allows me, I'll paraphrase what needs to be paraphrased for sake of time, but it won't diminish from the message. The Bible says here in verse 24 of Matthew, it says, no man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And then I also brought in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. And the reason why I'm bringing this up front is because I want to talk about what the world, what the term world really means. And I mentioned that earlier. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 2, in the epistles, verse 15, it says, love not the world, Neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, and the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Now you heard him say that twice, world, world, world. And that can be confusing uh, if it is used in a religious way. If it is used in a Pharisaic way. And that's what's happened way back yonder. When the Word of God talked about separation, people got confused because one part of it says that we're to be salt and light. So how can you be salt and light and yet be separated from the world? Because you're not to be separated or isolated from the world. You're to be integrated in the world as salt and light. But the thing is this, to be integrated in the world is not to be a part of the world. It's to be in but not of. The Bible says that we're from, when you're born again, you're from above with Christ. That's what the Word of God, no longer the natural man, we have to battle with it, right? That natural man wants to keep us pulled up, but the Word of God says, and we'll go there a little bit later, John 17, and he says, I am not of the world as they are not of the world. So we cannot be of, of the world, we can be in the world. But that's the same thing, now how do you love people Witness to people in love, speak the truth to them in love, if you can't be with them, if you can't work with them. You know, one time, if there, was a, if there were unbelievers, you, you couldn't work with them way back yonder. You couldn't work with them because they were taking the physical application and not understanding the spiritual need for what the Word of God was saying. Today, 
it seems to me to be the dark ages more than any other time. Because you have had the light come forth and men embrace darkness more today, more darkness now than they do the light. In Jesus' time, that's what he says, when the light came into men, they rather the darkness. But I believe people today in the world and this controlling force that we're dealing with loves darkness and is manipulating the people today, whether it be the church and the government on the streets, it's being brought to a place, as Brother Brian said, it's the, it's the opposite of what God has called us to walk in, hate. <coughs> the whole mantra that you see right now is hate. Hate, hate, which is darkness, darkness, darkness. Hate, hate, hate. These things are, no matter what, neither one of them are God, but love and light are. Lord, I just ask right now, Father God, that once more that you show us through your word what is acceptable to you as your people, Father God, and what is not. Lord, help us to live a lifestyle that declares light and love but repels all darkness and the dark works that are almost are, are amongst us today. Not almost, but are amongst us today. Lord, I ask that you Help us to be quick to share the truth of God's word with all who ask why we have hope in such a hopeless world. And Lord, we pray that the answer we share be with grace and season and salt and always delivered in love and admonition. Brothers and sisters, without a doubt, especially in today's times, no matter what the topic, clearly there are lines be drawn. You either for or against. There are lines being drawn that are intended to separate the world and its philosophies as compared to God's word and truth, the Bible. And always the side that we end up on as believers will decide, will be decided by choice. It's not by anything else, but by your choice, by my choice. And those decisions always bear fruit. They always bear fruit to where they come from, either of God or not. See, God doesn't have mixed fruit. Amen. God's fruit comes from an uncorruptible seed. Man's fruit comes from corruption and manipulation and self-centeredness. Our text reading is found in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 through 24. And our text is actually in that text reading, verses 22 through 24. So the text reading in itself is Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 through 24, and our text, or our keynote verses, are verses 22 and uh, through 24. Verses 22 through 24. When you get there, say amen. amen. The Bible says, This I say therefore, and testify in the Lord, and this is an epistle that Paul is speaking to the church, instructions to the church, that you henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk, in the vanity of the futility of their mind. Having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. Are you with me? Amen. The Bible continues and says, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanliness with greediness. But you have not so learned Christ. Now listen to this. But you have not so learned Christ, if so be that you have heard him and have what? Been taught by him as the truth is where? In Jesus. Does Jesus have two different truths? One for the world and one for man or one for his church? No. No. He is the truth. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. Period. Amen. Our text says this in verses 22 through 24. That we have an obligation if we've been taught by the Lord. Amen. Let me say it again. We have an obligation if we've been taught by the Lord. If we are redeemed. If we are genuine believers according to the word of God. Not according to what we think. But according to the word of God. That has started a transformation in our hearts. 
It may, it may not be seen fully or wholly in our lives yet, but we're still here, so we are a progressive work, amen, by the Holy Spirit. But you, you know that you know that you know that there's something different in your heart when you receive the Lord. I know that as long as I've been walking with the Lord, it's just a drop in the bucket compared to how long I want to walk with the Lord, which is forever. But I also know that many times things come against me, especially between my right ear and my left ear, that constantly want to uproot that faith that I have, that I am a, a different man. My past wants to lie to me. Satan wants to accuse me of things that happened in my past, B.C., before Christ. But I have to constantly remind myself so I can stand against that lie. We're not talking about B.C., we're talking about A.C., we're talking about after Christ. I'm a new man. I'm redeemed. And whenever Satan starts to really rise up, and I don't know about you guys, but this month has been really a month filled with a lot of havoc concerning my peace, concerning my strength, concerning everything that's going on around us. But you have to remember something. Whether you believe it or not, we're in the month of a dark holiday, a holiday called Halloween. A lot of people say, oh, that's nothing, Pastor. I'm going to tell you something. The roots of Halloween are dark, and they will always be dark. No matter how you decorate the fruit, they still are dark. They come from a wicked source, and you can't lighten something that is conjured up by the dark. But just saying that, he that is in us is greater than that's in the world. I agree. But you can't feed yourself off the world's folly and still make that statement and stand. That's beside the point. What I want you to hear is these next verses. Because that's your responsibility and my responsibility. If you are a genuine, blood law, redeemed child of God, if you've received the Lord as your Lord and your Savior, and don't come to me in, in, after the service and say, well, Pastor, I haven't bowed my knee yet to the Lord, but I, I know He's my Savior. That doesn't work. You can't receive Him as your Savior and not bow to Him as your Lord. In other words, you can't be the Lord of your own life. Do what you will and as you will. And when the time comes, say, I'm saved. Lord, I'm saved. No. Your life, if you are saved, will be transformed day by day, moment by moment. In a case like mine, with all the trash and garbage I had in my life, it, it instantaneously happened like a big blast. But then, after the big garbage was thrown out, how many of you know that it's kind of like a deep washing machine? It just keeps on agitating all the stuff that is hidden way down, deep down through my life so that 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 is hidden will be washed out. And that's what my life has been about. And that's what your life, if you're a true, genuine believer, you can expect that. But what you need to understand is you have a part to play in this. And when people tell me, well, if we're not to do a thing because then it's worse. Well, you, you, your mind has been brainwashed. You see, our lives, our salvation is not based on what you do BC. Thank God. You can't even earn your salvation. There's not a thing you can do to earn your salvation that's good enough. But on the same token, there's nothing that you've done that's bad enough that God can't deal with. He can deal with. Amen. Amen. But when you are saved, the byproduct of your life produces fruit, produces things that are contrary to what you were before and how you lived before and what your desires were before. Do you still have to battle those things? Yes, you do. But the more that you embrace God's word, the more that you embrace who you are now as compared to who you were then, the more that that transformation takes hold. It's like in my life. I am so grateful that I'm not the man I used to be. Can anybody say an amen to that? Amen. Don't say amen for me. Say amen for you. Amen. Because you see, it's about you and me. God don't put patchwork on nobody. God doesn't make you a better you. He makes you a new you. Amen? amen. New you. So, brothers and sisters, the Bible says in verses 22 through 24, that you put off concerning the former conversation, which actually means the former conduct. 
That includes your conversation, includes your thinking. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So brothers and sisters, it's about not only hearing the word of God, but doing the word of God. That you put off concern the former conversation, what? The old man. And I'm not talking about age, I'm talking about the old man, B.C. It's because you know, see you can't put off something that you, that you still want to hold on to. And if you want to, you know, most of us want to hold on to the things we want to hold on to because they haven't bothered us too much yet. But I want you to know as time goes on, the things that, that God gave you permission, didn't really give you permission, but, but allowed you to kind of want to decide on yourself that these things are hindering me. I don't want them. They're heavy weights in my life. I don't want them. You see, a lot of things God removes from you automatically. I mean, in the power of transformation when you first come to the Lord. But there are other things He wants you through your love for Him to decide. Not because they're inherently wrong, but because they cause you to stumble in your walk with God. That you, yourself, totally get rid of them. Because you see, you're not, you, you don't need artificial uh, things to, to make you feel better. Or to, to give you that sense of hope. You have God's word working in you. That's why the Bible says in verse 22 that you put off concern the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lose, uh, lust. Remember the Bible says, and uh, you don't have to go to Jeremiah 17, I think it is, where it says, the heart is deceitfully wicked above all else. Who can know it? The Lord God says, he answers that question, I'm searching. I know it. So even though, you know, a lot of people say, well, my heart's a good heart. I'm sure it is a good heart. But as compared to anything else, one's heart is, is good only if you consider it good. What's important is whether or not God considers it good. There's a lot of people that are not born again that are good, moral, general, loving people. They are. There's a lot. Of, I've met a lot of wonderful people that are moral and, and they love people and they're good natured. But even that in itself is not good enough for them to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Because that in itself came from God. But with that, it's just like Cornelius uh, in the Bible, in the book of Acts. Cornelius was, was not born again. But yet, he knew or he respected uh, the God of the Jews. And so he was a Gentile convert, actually. And he respected and he gave tithes and, and he, he did good things for for, for the people of God. And he prayed. He prayed to God. And God answered that prayer. He sent an apostle to minister unto him. To receive the Lord. So you see there are good people all over the place. And you can't say well just the body of Christ is good. Because I'll have to say no wait a minute. We need to take a closer look at that. Because it's not about that. But you and I as true believers. As genuine believers are obligated, actually commanded to get rid of one in order to put on the other. And that's about choice. The things that contribute to your own nature will always hinder you putting on your new nature. So you need to deal with that. If you got a problem with anger, you need to deal with that. If you got a problem with self-centeredness or complacency, you need to deal with that. And on a daily basis. The Bible says here that how do we do that? In verse 23, how do we do that? It's not about just, you can't strip off your flesh, right? So how do we do that? You renew your mind. And that's the same principle that I'm talking about concerning the church. That's the same principle that I'm talking about concerning who do you serve. That's the same principle that I'm talking about when I ask you to put in here on the side of that, in but not of. That's the same principle that I'm talking about when I say the lines, blurred lines are deception. Because you see, if your mind is not renewed, you'll fall either into religiosity, which is legalism, or you'll fall into completely liberalism. Neither one of them is right. What is right? The word of God. As brother said, it's the whole new man. It's the new man. You don't pour new wine in an old wineskin, do you? The Bible says here, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man. 
And you notice you can't put on the new man until you what? Say what? You take off the old and what? You can't put on the new. How do you put on the new man? You take off the old, you renew the mind, right? Then it says here, and that you put on the new man, which after God has created in righteousness and true holiness. You put off the off concerning the former conversation of the old man, conduct. Conduct comes from what? How you think. It doesn't come from the outside in. It goes from the inside out. And that's why the Bible, that's why the Word of God addresses the truth of the matter, the heart of the matter. He goes right to, he doesn't go and put a band-aid on a man. He says you got to take off one to put on the other. But then he gets down to the nitty-gritty. He gets down to the point. He says, you, in other words, he says, you can't strip off your outside body just like we can't strip off this outside world. We can't strip off the mentality of this world. It's got to work from the inside out. It's in other, in other words, for that old man to be taken off. In the church, you got to get the world philosophy out of the church. For the old man to be taken off in the old, in the world, they need to first receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. You can't take off one without putting on the other. But in the midst of that, you have to know how to put on the other for real. Amen. Just like when people say, well, I can't associate with this person because, because you know, they're in the world. Now, what he's talking about is that you can't partake of their folly. Doesn't mean that you can't talk to them. Doesn't mean that they actually can't be a good acquaintance of yours. But the problem is, is when you blur the lines and you partake of their folly, of their their philosophies, of their thoughts, and you say, well, you know, maybe, maybe that's not such a bad thing. That's the same thing that Satan did when he brought that same question to Eve. He said, hath God said? And the best way to answer that is, hold up your Bible, yes, God has said. Amen. So we know this, that in order to really truly take off the old man, and the which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, we have to be renewed in the spirit of our minds. And secondly, and that in order to do that, then we can put on the new man, which is after God, which after God is created in righteousness, and I love the way it says that, in true holiness. Not a, not a, a false holiness of religion. You know, there are a lot of people that want to walk around with, with you know, thus saith the Lord, and, and yet they, they have all kind of garbage going on in their lives. That's not true holiness. That's a facade. That's a pseudo spirit. And the world is tired of seeing a pseudo spirit coming from the church. They want to see the real thing. You see, tell you the truth, I want to see the real thing. Tell you the truth, God wants to see the real thing. Amen. And the way that you see the real thing in the church is first to look for it in yourself. Because you see, you are part of the church. We are not in ourselves the church, but we are part of the church. Our theme is this. There is no neutral ground with God. There is no neutral ground with God. Serve God or serve the world. There's no neutral ground with God. Serve God or serve the world. Now, Pastor, you just said uh, that we're not to, it's, that we can't be isolated from the world. That's right. So, how does this work? Well, I'm going to explain that to you. That's why I asked you to put cosmos next to world. Okay? The Bible says in our theme, there is no neutral ground with God. Serve God or serve the world. Open your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 30. I'll show you what God says concerning neutral ground. Mm -hmm. That people want to build their hopes on. Now this is God speaking. Reveal the word of God. And I want you to tell me if you see some neutral ground in God's commandment. Here. Chapter 30 of Deuteronomy. Verse 19. The Bible says, the Word of God says, I call heaven and earth to record or witness this day against you, that I have set before you life and death. Do you see a neutral ground there? What do you have? Life or what? Death. No neutral ground, right? Blessing and cursing. Is there a neutral ground there? 
No, it's either blessing or cursing. Therefore, do what? Choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. So in other words, he was saying, point blank, that there's only one way to life. And there's only one way to be truly blessed. And that's by choosing my word. Do you see any neutrality here, Sister Cindy? Is God a liar? Is God's word absolute? Is God's word truth for today as well? What about all the masses of people that declare that God's word is not relative or it, it's archaic to today's culture, to today's society? What do you tell them? I say what? Same yes, he is. Same yesterday, today, and forever. And it changes now, right? And this is something that I, I shared with my with uh, one of my relatives. I don't remember who it is. It might be my dad. It may not be. I don't want to constantly pick on him. But he made a comment, he said, like most of them said, you know, most people say they don't want to believe the Word of God, or whoever was that said it. Well, you know, the Bible is written by man. Now I've heard that before, right? And, but yet the Word of God already had that answer in line. He says, it, it, it was written by man, but it's inspired by God. And that's the same thing that I have to say that when people say, well, it's archaic, and, you know, God's out of touch with things, if the God that you, you serve is out of touch with things, it's not relative to today. And I always look at him point blank and tell him, I said, you know something? Whether you believe it or not, one day you will know it, that God is God. Here. See, that's not going to be a question if, because they will know that God is God. Either with him, or apart from them, but they will still know that God is God, there's none other. Okay, well, who it is? I had a conversation with my dad one time a long time ago that I shared with many of you before. And you know, he's, he's a very intelligent dude, guy, and uh, he's read the Bible many times, and he's, he's well told me. He said, I've read the Bible many times. I said, Fine, Dad. But you read it as a book, and I read it as a life source. There's a difference. And you know, he went on to tell me all these things and he can really get into a lot of things. I mean, some deep things and some things way out there. Uh, but I cut to the chase every time and I told him, I said, my dad, I love you with all my heart. I really do. And I, I always thank you for the things he's done for me and the things he wished he could have done for me. Because I know as a dad, I understand that feeling. Things that we've done for our loved ones and things that we wish we could have done for them. And I, I, I like I told him then, I said, Dad, I said, everything that you're saying, if you're wrong, which I believe, in fact, I know you are, that when that last moment comes, you've lost everything, including me and everyone that you've loved. But if I'm right, which I know I am, I'm gain plus. And yet, even if I'm wrong and you're right, my life now is better than you. Because the way that I live is separate from the way the world is. Because the way that I live is different from the way the world's mentality is. You are called to be a contrast. You're not called to blend. I've said it many times before. You're not called to blend. Yes, you're to be integrated so that you can be salt, as salt is meant to do. It doesn't replace your meal, but it keeps your meal uh, or your meat. What? That's right. It preserves it. And it also has a certain influence as life does. We're to be an influence to the world. And we're to actually hold back the, the, the rotting, if you will, of the world. By being different, by presenting a light in the midst of darkness. We can't stop it. But we're to, to slow it down. Did anybody hear what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, let's keep our ears open because I've just begun. As we read the New Testament, it is clear that we are not to become entangled with the world. Or better put, according to the Bible, to be of the world, nor to love the world. Did we read that in 1 John 2.15? It's exactly what it said. And also James 4.4, 4, Sister Caroline has a powerful, powerful statement. I mean, it's so derogatory, it's so powerful, it cuts, I mean, cuts to the heart of the matter. 
The Bible says in James 4, 4, the epistle, it says that God's word says, you adulterers and adulteresses, know you not that the friendship of the world is enmity or enemy with God? Now that almost sounds like an oxymoron, right? It really does. If you don't understand what he's talking about when he says world. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is, in the, is the enemy of God. Now, don't you think that is, that is a direct, I mean, punch to the gut of anybody? He doesn't pull any punches, does he, Brother Roger? He says, if you're going to be friends with the world, you are committing spiritual adultery. Adulterers and adulteresses. He says, you actually become an enemy to me. Man, that's some hard talk, huh? But when you understand what he's actually saying, Sister Victoria, he's talking about when you embrace the vain thoughts of Gentiles, like what we read in Ephesians chapter 4, 17. Because those vain talk, uh, thoughts of Gentiles alienate you from the life of God. So when we embrace the world's mentality, when we base our decisions off of what the world do, when we base what our, our convictions on according to tradition or what family wants us to do or what culture wants us to do or what you, whatever, whatever your relatives want you to do, then guess what? You're serving man. You're serving your manicism, but you're not serving God. Because you can't serve both. If there's a direct contract, and what I'm saying is, if we embrace the vanity of our Gentile thinking of the way we used to think, the way we used to do, the way we used to be, because the majority of people are doing that now, and the, many of them are so-called evangelical believers, and they're saying, well, hey, listen, if we, you know, we, <clears throat> we need to do this, we need to do that, you know, after all, we're just all one big happy family. No, we're not. If you embrace the very world's mentality, which is called the cosmos, then you're embracing the darkness of the God of this world. And if you're embracing the darkness of the God of this world, you're being alienated from the life of God. That's what the Word says. And that's what I see happening in the church. The lines are being smudged. The lines were laid down. By God's word. But as time went on. As compromise went on. As worldliness came in the church. As the church accepted Trojan horses. As gifts of worldly entertainment. And everything else. And accepted the, the philosophies. Of having a successful church. Is for how many numbers of people you have. What kind of ties you have. What kind of houses you have. What kind of cars you drive. That is not success. According to the word of God. And if you base your success and your hope on those things. Then you are doing exactly what 1 John 2.15 says not to do. Are the blessings of God to be cast away? No. But they're to follow you. They're not to overtake you. The mentality of the world. You need to be able to see it as, as that of the world. You need to be able to see that when people speak. Whether it be in the church or behind the pulpit. Somebody asked me not too long ago. Why don't you validate a candidate? Aren't you supposed, as a pastor, supposed to sway your people? I said, not at all. Not at all. I will not, not validate to you whom I think you should follow after or whom you should put in the office. I'm not a politician. I know who I'm going to vote for. I know what God's word says. I don't need somebody to pull my strings in my heart and pull my, try to manipulate my emotions and try to tell me who to hate and who to love. God's word says, love the sinner. Hate the sin. I don't see anywhere where it tells, God's word tells you and I, or tells me as a pastor, to lead you in how to make decisions. I will present the word of God to you. Without compromise, the whole council laid down for you and let your conscience guide you. Because you see, the fruit of your doings will either justify you or it will judge you.
The Bible says, as I just read earlier, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Again, are we talking about the physical world? Are we talking about people, brother, watch you? Are we talking about creation, the trees and the earth? Are we to hate that? It's talking about the mindset, the mentality, the philosophies of the world. And that's what you see going on right now. For the life of me, when I, I hear believers say, well, you, you know what the Madonna said? That Madonna, yeah, uh, believers say, man, Madonna can't stand this one, or doesn't want that one, or some, uh, some other celebrity, Hollywood celebrity that, that people watch or listen to that sing beautifully, or that, that, that actually uh, motivate young people or even older people to believe that they're of God, because you know that, hey, listen, they mention Jesus every once in a while. I'm not moved by one actor that I've heard on TV. Because you know why? By name, they are actors. I'm not moved, hear me well, by any politician that I hear. Do you know why? Because by name, they are politicians. Actors. You hear what I'm saying? God is not an actor. God says, before the day was, I am. Before the day was, I am. He's the one that created day. He's the one that created eternity. He's beyond eternity. He doesn't need a Hollywood version or someone to play act him. You want to know about God? And you want an intimate relationship with him? Surrender your life to him unconditionally. The Bible says in John 15, 19. Go there for me. Am I making any sense to you guys? Do you see that's where we are today in the cultural crossroads? Both in the church and in the world. And in this nation. John 15, 19, then we'll move over to James 17, 14, and 16. John 15, 19. Amen. The Bible says there, this is the Lord Jesus Christ speaking. He says, let me go up one verse, in verse 18. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, now listen, if you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you are not of the world, but have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hated you. Does that mean that you, your family hates you? No. Does that mean that uh, uh, the animals outside hate you? Does that mean that uh, the world, the physical world that you see hates you? Does that mean that somebody uh, that is spouting hate hates you? Their mentality. It's not them. It's the mentality. What you hear coming out of people uh, is what's been force-fed them through years and years and years of this deceptiveness. And now they're in delusion, what I call the spirit of delusion. You, you understand what this is. That's right. When it comes out, as long as you can provide for their physical well-being, they're fine. But the moment that you're separated from the physical and standing in that that is eternal, which is spiritual, that's when they want to crucify you. When they say, oh, God is great. You say, yes, he is. When you're born again, you'll know him as your Lord and Savior. And they say, well, God, you know, the God of the universe, or the force that is greater than the force that I live in, or that the universe told me, the universe don't speak to you. Either God speaks to you or the devil speaks to you. It depends what ear you live in your mind. There's no universal God. There's no, well, God the universe, God uh, the sky, God the moon, God the... No, there's only one God. The creator of all these, the physical world. So it's not the world, the physical world 
that God is referring to when he says, come out ye from them, is it? It's not a physical world that God says, don't be corrupted, or it's not the physical world that he's referring to when he says, hate the world, is it? But he is speaking about the world. The Bible says in John 17, 14 through 16, Again, this is Jesus speaking directly to his disciples. I have given them thy word. Are you with me? And the world hated them because they are what? Not of the world. So when you see the people, whether it be uh, especially your media, or whether it be Hollywood actors, or whether it be compromises, or whether it be uh, uh, apostatizing believers, what are they going to do when the line is drawn towards you? Their mentality, that hatred, will be pointed to the only place they can point it at, you. When you stand how? In direct contrast not in, not in brute force, not in, you know, my, my dog is bigger than your dog, or my stick is, is meaner than your stick, or my gun's bigger than your gun, or my mouth's bigger than your mouth. No. It's when you say, without budging, without moving, without swaying to the right or left, this is what the Word of God says. This is what God's Word, this is the will of God revealed to me and to all those who would read it. God sent his own God son to die for the world. Why? Because he loved the world, right? So when we understand, when people start to, whether it be one way or another, they say, well, you know, God tells us not, and I've seen that, and because of ignorance, well, we can't, we can't associate with the world. He's, he's talking about their philosophies, their mind, the way that, with the things that entertain them. It's like when people want to throw the hodgepodge of actors and, and, and entertainers in and, and you know, they, they know the word, you know. They, well, many of the entertainers come from a church background. Do you know that? And then they got perverted when they got out. Because, you know, the, the religiosity took hold, you know. I'll never forget when I would stay with my grandmother some summers, they had a little Pentecostal church across from the street from us. I'd go stay with her in a little town called Basile. A little town. And she was a devout Catholic. And we would go and play football in the back, in the, in the back lot of the uh, Pentecostal church, a little high steeple, old fashioned Pentecostal church, stained glass and the that you couldn't see in it. And of course, on certain days you could hear them really having a service, you know. And my grandmother would, would come on those days and she, she said, you gotta come in the house. I said, why? She said, because there's some devils going on in there. <laughs> Anything that was contrary to, to what she understood as being. So, you know, she went, she went to the extent of even putting cotton in our ears so we couldn't hear them. She said, they're screaming and hollering. They were praising God. Okay, she had no difference. Today, you got people that are standing on the Hollywood block declaring to you how you should praise God. According to their concept, they're half naked. And their bodies are, are being thrust out for everybody to see. You say, Pastor, just turn your eye. I do. But it doesn't mean that they don't put it out there. And people worship that. If they say that God said, I Ray Holtz, Beautiful, had a beautiful voice and a lot of people followed him. And then he came out and said, you know, I'm gay. Been gay all my life. Been da, da, da. He said, God told me it's okay to be like I am. And so he divorced his wife and married somebody else. And he said, it's okay. So he told everybody, it's okay. God spoke to me personally and said, it's okay for me to live as I'm living in homosexuality. And you don't realize how many people he hurt because of that lie? That just had to come out, but I want you to know something. 
I see the same thing in many people that come out of the church that, that have truly been gifted. I mean gifted with wonderful talents. And then they get into the Hollywood scene and man, they are totally corrupted. Whitney Houston, beautiful voice. And I know she was raised in church. And she went wayward. From what I understand, the last moments of her life, she returned, uh, repented, returned to the Lord. I don't know, only God knows for sure. But how many people, my brothers and sisters, God has a line drawn. And the reason why he draws it is not so that he can take away the good times from us. It's because he knows how seductive the world is. Because our natural man is still trying to take over. Your natural thoughts. The Bible says, as we just read, if you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you're not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hated you. And John 17, 14 through 16, the Bible says that Jesus said, I have given them thy word, and the world hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Is that a clear-cut line of who we're supposed to be? We're not supposed to be in the world because Jesus is not in the world. How is it that believers, professing believers, can sit there and tell me that they can live and they can choose to make decisions based on humanicism that overrides God's Word? Because God wouldn't do that. Jesus wouldn't do that. Jesus didn't do anything that the Father didn't show Him to do. And when he says, I'm not of the world as you're not of the world, what is that supposed to mean for us? Does it mean just for those disciples, apostles then? No, it's for you and I today. So when there's a question of how you should choose in anything, if there's a question of how you should live in anything, you should live in accordance to how Jesus lived. You should live in accordance to what his word says. Because you're not of the world, even though you're in this world. The Bible says in James 1.27, Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from what? The world. The world. Again, do you think that's a physical application there? No, that's a mental. Because how do you put on the new man? By renewing your mind. You've got to take off what? The old first? And you got to do what to put on the new? Renew the mind. Isn't that what he's talking about here when he says that? Keep yourself unspotted by the world. He said, do the good thing. Do what's right. Yes, tend to the, to the fatherless, the orphan. Tend to the afflicted widows. Why? Because they don't have anyone to help them. That's why. Tend to them. But he said, whatever you do, keep yourself unspotted by the world. What is the world that the Bible talks about? Not to be part of. And again, I answered that in the free loop, but let me answer it again for you today in full context. To answer that in a way that separates, and I want you to remember that word too, separate. Are we to be separate from the world? Yes, yes we are. Are we to be isolated from the world? Yes. So how can we be separated and not isolated? By the renewing of our mind. The renewing of our mind to what? To the great intellectuals of this age? No. To the Word of God. That's what separates us. And the more it goes in this age, and the more it goes in this culture, and the more it goes into the different things that we're facing, it becomes even more evident that the only way that we can walk in the new man is to stay with a renewed spirit of mind. And that's in the little Word of God. And as you look around you, as you see all the political platforms, you see all the, the protests and the platforms in the streets, you see all the lawlessness going on around us, can you tell me why that is going on? And amongst many churches as well, whom are divided. Why? Well, first of all, the church, those who are professing believers, they have not renewed, renewed their mind. So therefore, they are taking part or folly of the world. The world, the philosophies of the world. There are three meanings attached to the word world. The first 
The Bible says that there's a created world in Genesis. A created world. God made the world and everything in it. And we are inherently, if we are here walking around today, are in that physical world. That's what Acts 17 verse 24 point A says. So it is not the physical world that we see that he's talking about, is it? Just do what it means. The second thing is, there are the inhabitants of the world, people, whom the Bible says God loves. Doesn't it? Were you born saved? No. no. We weren't. So God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son to, what, die for the world. Why? So that we could be saved. So, <laughs> The second thing, when he says, uh, speaking about the world, he's talking about the inhabitants of the world. Again, whom the Bible says is the flow that he loved, and for whom Christ died, which were at one time, the Bible says, sinners, just like we were. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, John 3, 16. We all know that. So it's certainly not referring to this either. Otherwise, sister, joy, God would be a hypocrite. And so would we. Because he has called us to be salt and light to the world, to the people who are in darkness. So again, when he's talking about the world, he's not talking about staying away from people. And you need to stay away, you need to draw boundaries when you're fooling or associating with people of the world or people that are not of the right mindset, that are anti-God. They may not. You know, the thing is, most people do not think they're anti-God. But the reason why they don't think they're anti-God is because they don't know God. And that's a fact. So it's not about, it's not about staying away from uh, people. Because like I said, that would be an oxymoron. That would be a contradiction. We are, because we are in the workforces that involve all types of people. We're in our everyday life involved. But you're not to partake of their philosophy, their mindset, their thinking. And when their thinking starts to overshadow yours, you need to have a, a what I call boundaries set up so that you gracefully but quickly depart from that association, whether it be temporary or in some cases permanently. Anybody hear what I'm saying? So you see, if we can't associate with the, if the, what God is talking about the world is to stay away from people, then how can we be solved in life? It's impossible. So clearly this is not what is meant either. So thirdly, this is what we're talking about. I ask you to remember that. It's a term called cosmos, meaning the world system. Cosmos means the world system, which is headed by Satan and based upon self, greed, and pride, and self-gratification. That's the very things that the epistle in 1 John 2.15 talked about. The lust of the flesh. And that's what cosmos the world that the Lord God is talking about for us to be separated from and to be isolated from by the renewing of our mind. But not from people and not from creation, but from the philosophies, the world system which is set up to be based off of self-gratification, which is humanism. Brothers and sisters, there is a statement that, that often form compromises. And I hear people, liberal people, Say it often, it goes like this. What the heart wants, the heart gets. So go for it, no matter what. You deserve to be happy. To have what and who you want, regardless of what the Word of God says. Yet the Bible draws the lines to what is of God and that which is not. From Romans 1.25, for your own study. Romans 1.25 and verses 28 through 32. This is the mindset and the philosophies that are not of God. And it really started, and we're going to read this in Genesis chapter 3. It started in Genesis, which means the beginning, chapter 3, verses 4 through 7. The philosophy, the world mindset, or the cosmos started with the introduction of a conversation with Satan and Eve. The Bible says in verse 4, And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall 
not surely die. For God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as God, knowing good and evil. Now let me ask you, you hear many people today, whether they be uh, politicians, or whether they be uh, compromised churches, or whether they be Hollywood stars, they all seem to have their own version of what God is and what God's not, and what God accepts and what God doesn't accept. If you listen to Oprah Winfrey, she has her own concept of what she calls the Jesus mentality or the Christ cosmos mentality. That it's a mindset, a spiritual element, but it doesn't have anything to do with affecting the world. It doesn't have anything to do with the person of Jesus Christ. And that is delusion. That's an occult. I don't care how good she is. I don't care how generous she is. Her understanding of, and she was raised in a denominational teaching church. But you see, raising someone in a church doesn't make them a Christian. You can put labels on them, doesn't make them, I know pastors who have become pastors and they're not believers. they didn't stay long. One, one pastor that I served many years ago, there was somebody that be, became a reverend and he had reverend written all over his, his lapel and his, his, his coat and in, in his, his, his truck and he didn't speak directly to him but he just put out this statement because this particular person had, had really built himself up into being feeling that he was a pastor or a reverend even. He said those, and he was an African from Africa, and he said, those who would be a pastor must have a flock. You remember Sister Word? You remember Sister Nell? The servant said, for God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be what? As God. Isn't that what many are saying right now? I know better than the Bible. Oh, listen. Many politicians are saying, hey, listen, I'm a Christian, I know better than the Bible, yet they promote everything that is anti-Bible, anti, anti let's put it this way, anti-God. Your choices define you, brothers and sisters. Just like platforms define people. Anybody hearing me today? It says this, and when the woman saw, what does she depend on, Brother Roger? Her sight. Is that how we're supposed to walk? No, we're supposed to walk how? By faith through obedience, right? Faith that is alive is obedient. It says here, and when the, when the woman saw, in other words, she embraced or leaned towards her own sight. To define whether or not something was good or bad. That the tree was good for food. And that it was pleasant to the eyes. And a tree to be desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat. And gave also unto her husband with her and did eat. And the eyes of them were both were open. And they knew. That they were naked. See before. When they were in the presence of God. And the glory of God. They were covered by his presence. But when they departed. From. God. They were exposed. They're naked. Right now this world. Is being exposed for who it is. Right now our politicians. Are being exposed. For what they represent. You may not like a person, but look at what they represent. Look what they stand on. You may not like me as your pastor. I'm not asking you to like me. That's why you're here. I'm asking that you come here and hear the word of God. That's why you come here. Because you know that I'm not going to compromise it in what I share and teach or how I live. I'm not perfect. Y'all know that. I still use duct tape wherever I can. 
But the thing I don't do is compromise the word of God. What's that, brother? I thought that was funny. <laughs> <laughs> well, somebody gave me a, um, I think it was Sister Ron that gave me a plaque one time. Something about duct tape. Remember that, Sister Ron? I remember how it goes, but it pretty much was like that. A lot of my brothers and sisters that have been with me a while know that if I can't fix something, as long as I got duct tape, I'm good. Only thing I don't use duct tape with, Brother Mike, is the Word of God. Because they don't need my help. Amen. Brothers and sisters, the Bible says, In the eyes of them, both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. You see, that's what the world is trying to do. That's what the world is trying to do right now. You see, brothers and sisters, let me tell you this up front. And again, this is not from a political standpoint, but let me say it. If you're looking for a man to fix this world, you're looking in the wrong place. What you need to look for and look to is to have time so that we can make an impression or influence this world. What will give us that time to do that? What will make us use this time as we're supposed to, to redeem the time for the days of evil? How many of you know the days are evil? But you know why they're evil? Not because the day in itself is evil. It's because of the philosophies that are going about, the propaganda that is going about, the uh, turning upside down of what was right, now calling it wrong, and what was wrong, now calling it right, what was dark, now calling it light. What was light, calling it dark. What was sweet, calling it bitter, and vice versa. You know the scripture in Isaiah 5, 20, 21. Brothers and sisters, this is the world that God warns us about. And it is this world, system and philosophy of self-indulgences that Christians ought to shun and remain free from. The warnings are clear. The warnings are clear. The Bible says in Romans 12, 2, do not be conformed to this world. The Bible teaches in Galatians 1, 4, that Christ gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil age. Now, this present evil age, that's in uh, Galatians chapter 1, 4. This present evil age is what we're talking about when we use the word world, which is cosmos. The present evil age. It's not the world, physical world, nor is it the people. It's the mentality, the philosophy. And that's what the Word of God says in Galatians 1 4. Christ gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil age. Cosmos. Greek lexicon has it cosmos, K O S M O S. In other words, and I'm almost going to have to stop here, brothers and sisters, and resume Wednesday because it is a deep teaching. And uh, how many of you want to hear more of it Wednesday? Amen. How many of you think that it's a needed thing to hear? Amen. Especially in lieu of the things that we are at a crossroads at. Amen? Amen. The Bible says here, in other words, what I'm saying, what the Word of God is saying and warning us about, is the world and its philosophies and mindsets. Sister Dorothy. It's the philosophies and mindsets of the world and the compromises and apostasies that have come into the church through these philosophies. And what you need to understand, this was back then, way back when, in, the, in Exodus and Genesis and Deuteronomy and Numbers and all the prophets, all the way up into the New Testament, a danger to God's people. And it's still a danger to us all today. You know, when... Balaam sold himself out to Balak. It was so that understanding that he would curse God's people. And when he stood upon the mountain to curse God's people, he tried three times and he couldn't because when he looked down upon God's people, the way that they had situated themselves, that with all the tribes and the way that they were ordered in here, the way that they were ordered to surround the tabernacle of the Lord, that it actually, from a distance up on high, it is said that the numbers of the tribes that they had in each tribe actually formulated a cross when they looked down. So he couldn't, couldn't curse that that has been blessed of God. But he told Balak, he says, don't worry, I couldn't curse them. 
but they will curse themselves because they will partake of the Amalekites, of the Amorites. They will partake of the folly of the world. They will take from them and bring it into their own camp. And you know what happened? Exactly that. Now I'm going to find a place to stop here for today because we're running out of time. It's about the world's philosophies and mindsets, and it still is because it's such a great danger to our souls, our souls, our mind, will, and emotions, and that's where, and that's what God warns us about. That's why God says, come out from them and be ye separate of them. It's the mindset, the philosophies. And that's why it's so important to understand what Galatians 2.20 is all about. And again, let me emphasize to you, church, and remind you about something. No matter what you hear today or don't hear today or don't believe today, let me tell you this. God does not change. Throughout the Bible, His Word to us are the lines that has provided of what is of God and not of God, which are definitely drawn between the world of unbelievers and the world of the children of God. The Bible says that genuine believers shall be known by their fruit. Now listen again to the word of God as I bring it to a place of closing for today. Whosoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. What is he talking about? The philosophies, the mindset of the world. Do I hear an amen to that? Amen. Do you agree with that? Amen. Jesus himself said to the Father, the world has hated him because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world. If Jesus wanted us to be taken out of the world, then he would have taken us home. But he doesn't. He asks that we be protected in this evil world. Why? So that we can be salt and light. Why? So that we can be a contrast so that we can be what God has called us to be, a light in the darkest night, a light that cannot be hidden. But the only way that can happen is not from a church setting. We come out from church, go into the world as light, as salt, because we've just had our minds renewed in the spirit of our minds. When people don't come to church and they say, well, I'm okay, but your mind is more clued in and plugged in to that of the world's philosophy than it is to the church, to the Bible, to the Word of God. Now, I guarantee you there are churches that want to promote football games, want to promote everything else but not God's Word. They don't want to talk about sin. They don't want to talk about unrighteousness. They don't want to talk about absolute truth. But I want to tell you, I'm not one of those churches. So if you want to get your mind and keep your mind renewed, let me help you do that by plugging into the faith that causes things to happen. And that's the Word of God. Amen. That's the Word of God. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, I close with this statement. The Bible teaches us that genuine believers, the followers of Jesus Christ, will face opposition in the world. The world that we are to be separate, separated from according to God's word is the cosmos, meaning the prevailing system of thought. This is the dominion of Satan, the mindset, the philosophies of humanism. Now listen, if you don't hear anything else, the philosophies that I'm talking about of humanism are those philosophies that you'll read in Romans 1, as I spoke about, that exalt the creature above the Creator. Therefore the lines are drawn. First by God, and then needed be by us. Through choice, the renewal of our minds, or the acceptance of the world's philosophies. Our lives are defined by our choices. And our choices define our lifestyles. Father God, I ask, Lord God, the word that you had me share with all the protocols and all the laying down foundations and all the explanations. That Lord God, it didn't close the ears that need to hear this. But it pricked their interest and their desire. It wetted their tongues. Lord, we are 
in a crossroads. This nation, this world, the church, the lines are drawn. Let us choose the right side. Let us take off the old, put on the new. And to do that, we need to have our minds renewed. Father God, I pray that all the people of God here today that I've been able to share the word of God with, whether it be here physically or by video, that they dig deep and seek the water that doesn't run dry. That they embrace who they are in Christ and grow in grace. I pray that we touch one another in faith and that, Lord, we always reach out to those, whether they hate us or whether they love us, with nothing but the truth and love. And I ask that everyone be blessed today as they go forth. And remember, if you're in Christ Jesus, you're not of this world, even though you're in this world. Jesus says, I'm not of this world as they are not of this world because I've given them your word. May all of you be blessed and stay strong in the name of Jesus. Everybody.